uh, uh, first I want to thank you all for uh, being with us uh, today and uh, for accepting our invitation uh, for this webinar uh, and the occasion to celebrate the uh, World Author Day in its first edition in Tunisia. So I want to thank Dr. Paul from the International Author Survival Fund for accepting uh, our invitation to tell us more about their uh, endeavors to conserve author species worldwide. Before starting with uh, Dr. Paul, I want to say that uh, the Tunisian Association for Wildlife um, uh, has been for uh, years, for a few years now, um, tracking, collecting data, and uh, uh, conducting scientific expedition to study a particular species of uh, otter in, uh, in Tunisia, living in Tunisia, which is the uh, Eurasian otter, Lutra Lutra. And uh, through our work, uh, we're uh, trying to implement a strong and um, uh, effective and dynamic a uh, network of scientists, researchers, and aware citizens uh, to try and uh, be able to conserve uh, this species in our country. Uh, we will go through the details of our work tomorrow uh, and the creation of the species in Tunisia uh, and North Africa with uh, Dr. Mohsin uh, Kelbousi and Burhan. For today, we're going to keep it uh, like a larger approach uh, and uh, put the other in its international context and um, and uh, talk about uh, the IOSF activities. Uh, so if you may keep your uh, mic uh, muted uh, to give us all the opportunity to uh, hear Dr. Paul clearly. And uh, if you have any question, you can uh, write it down in the comment section and we will make a selection and try to ask Dr. Paul after uh, he finishes his presentation. So thank you all for listening and I hope you will enjoy this, uh, this uh, webinar. So, Dr. Paul, I'll, uh, I'll give you the, the word okay. now if you may share your uh, presentation. Okay. Um, can't see that. Oh, okay. That's fine. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can um, uh, hear me okay. Um, I'm Dr. Paul Yoxon from the International Otter Survival Fund. I've worked on otters about 30 years now. The International Otter Survival Fund has been going for 28 years um, this year. Now, today's presentation is about the work we've done on the, the Eurasian otter and the work of the International Otter Survival Fund over the, the 28 um years it was world otter day on the 27th of may and we had these are all the areas around the world where people did otterly things they did exhibitions they did artwork they gave a, a presentation with this uh virus people couldn't do as much we used to get a lot of help from uh zoos but obviously they couldn't help um this year the otter is a member of the mustelid family, so it's related to the weasel and the stoat. If you think the mustelids are the most aggressive mammals on the planet, people think of tigers or lions, but the weasel can carry and kill 10 times its weight. A uh, tiger can't do that at all. And they're related to the pine martin. We have pine martins, there's also other species of martin and and the polecat and they're related to the badger but this is our otter this is the same otter you have in um at tunisia at lutra lutra it's a semi-aquatic mammal so it's severely uh, compromised because it has to live in the land and on the water it doesn't have a blubber layer and like a seal. So a seal or a whale have a thick blubber layer, but you couldn't have an otter having a blubber layer because it wouldn't be able to run. So it has a tiny blubber layer, but it, it relies on its insulation by the fur. It has an inner fur of 100,000 hairs per square centimeter, and that traps air. And it has an outer fur that's like wearing a waterproof uh, jacket. The sea otter off the California coast has 150,000 hairs per square centimetre because they basically live in the sea most of their life. 
Yeah. Some lots of facts about the Eurasian otter. Obviously, the male is longer and um, heavier. In Britain, we have a population of about 10,000 otters, which isn't that much really. We think we've got 500,000 badgers. 300,000 uh, uh, foxes and only 10,000 otters. And unfortunately, I don't know the true population of otters in your, your uh, country. They are protected by one European law, and in Britain we have the Wildlife and Countryside Act. But as Britain isn't in Europe, I don't know if they are actually protected by the European law. There, there are two populations of otters, Eurasian otters. There's a freshwater population that's nocturnal and the females range 30 uh, uh, kilometers and the rate, males will range much larger distances. It's all the same species and we have a, oh, this is a freshwater otter. So that's why it's far more difficult to see otters in the uh, uh, fresh waters because they have such big home ranges and they're only mostly active in the evening. And we have a coastal Eurasian otters, and they're active in the day and night. And if the habitat's right, like it is in the north of Scotland where we live, you can get a, a female occupying three to five uh, uh, kilometers of coastline. That's why it's relatively easy, easy to see them. We're quite fortunate because we live on the co coast and we can watch otters outside our house. And this is the coastal population, but they are the same, same otter. The thing with the coastal otters, I mentioned the insulation. When an otter living on the coast is coated in salt water, it knocks the thermal insulation down by 35%. Uh, 35, uh, so the otters have to wash in a fresh water, fresh water pools to, to wash the salt off. So you never ever get otters in coastal areas unless you get the freshwater pools. Uh, the otters fare and insulation, I mentioned this actually, actually before. And air, I mentioned, I said 100,000, I'm sorry, it was uh, only 50,000 hertz per square centimetre. But air is a better insulator than uh, blubber. The diet of the Eurasian otter it eats a lot of different things, but mostly it's uh, uh, fish. Um, this is the summary of the diet. They'll eat uh, sort of most, mostly fish, eely like fish. They'll eat small mammals and birds. Um, in the springtime, we find they eat uh, uh, sort of, uh, frogs and toads, and because the skin of the frog and toad is uh, toxic, They'll just take the insides out, so you can see that quite often what looks like um, flattened the uh, frogs, but they've been eaten by the otter. Those are coastal otters. We the, these the elite crabs, but mostly um, eighty-five percent of the diet is consists of well, where we live. Uh, Five key prey species, things like blennies and rockling, sea scorpion, butterfish, and saith. The saith is, is, is a free living uh, fish. And if you go to the Outer Hebrides and the coast of Norway, these five key prey species are so important. Diet of uh, the freshwater otters, um, eels is the biggest thing, and eels in our country have declined by. At 90%, and that's why a lot of otters in the freshwater systems in England are going into fish ponds in people's homes because their home range is increasing because the eel population has really declined. There's no real breeding season of otters, um, although in Shetland, which is the northern tip of Scotland, it's about 100 miles from Aberdeen. Um, they had a, a seasonality of breeding, but because the otter populations have gone down in Shetland, now there isn't a seasonality. They have two to three cubs a year. The, 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 
you're raising off it's difficult to bring up three cups so often the mother will leave one and just just bring up the two um they develop slowly with the eyes opening here for weeks in seven weeks they're more active and take a solid fuel this is a thing we have to work on because we actually run on not to be able to rehabilitation sensors, so we, we take an orphan and injured otters, and I'll talk about that as well. At 10 weeks, they eventually... Your age not as like all otters don't... ...13 to 14 months, so it's a long, long uh, process. And in our, our, our country, um, we're finding otters are dying at such a young age. Um, in Shetland, which is one of them, used to be one of the best places to watch otters, they're dead before they're fun off a few years old. And yet in Germany, in Czech Republic, they're, they're living to 15. So if you think an otter isn't sexually mature until it's maybe 60 months old, it has two cubs a year, it doesn't breed every year, you can work out the equation, it's really difficult to make them the raised nuts population increase. The Euros nuts was one of the sad casualties of the 20th century. It declined 95 percentage range in Western Europe and became extinct in Switzerland, Belgium, um, Holland. And it's only now, I've only got maps. This is the worldwide uh, distribution. It all seemed quite, quite nice, but. Um, We've no idea of the populations in Russia and China. And uh, I know for a fact the Eurasian Australia is actually declining in countries like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. This is our country, you see before 1950, and now at 1990, uh, the population is slightly recovered. We live on the Isle of Skye, that's on the northwest coast. So something obviously happened. Otters were hunted in our, our country. And this is sighting from an from a otter hunt back in southern England. And again, after 1950, uh, they started to decline. There was a magazine that was published in 1960. It was the gamekeeper, for people who like to hunt. And it had on the front page in 1960, where have all the otters gone? So something was affecting the urotter. Our rivers were the straightened. So we had massive habitat loss and a disturbance was affecting the Eurasian otter. Um, hunting was going on. Otters weren't protected in England until 1979. In Scotland, it wasn't until 1984. Changes in the river use, this is obviously a not good habitat for the otter. But the reason for the decline was a group of chemicals called organochlorines, dialdrin and aldrin that we used in sheep dip. They used in coating of the seeds in agriculture to stop the birds uh, uh, taking the seeds. And organochlorines are incredibly complicated compounds of carbon, chlorine, and hydrogen, highly toxic, and they all well a majority have been banned because of them, separately. They, they, they degrade slowly in the environment. And when we stop using organochlorines in our country, the rivers improved and otters slowly came back. But we have present day uh, pollution problems. The, the PCBs, polychlorinated benthols, were used in paints and then in insulators in the electric industry. And there was a high link between high levels of PCBs in otters and the loss of vitamin A, and you need vitamin A um, to fight off illness. This was work done by Masson and McDonald from Exeter University. And now we have a, a whole new, we have a friend who's a chemist in Luxembourg, and he's been working on this. And there's, these PCDDs are very similar chemicals to PCBs, they're used as flame retardants, you have them in your car seats and uh, 
your car, um, sorry, your housing, uh, the seats, and these also can cause a climb. And work from Cardiff University is the only people left in our country who do auto postmortems and toxicology, you have endocrine hormone a disruptors. And this it sounds complicated, but they're using common things like shampoos, um, it, um, you can get them from tins and they can, they can leach up water bottles and the sun cream. And they, Cardiff University, they found that caused the male otter, Eurasian otter penis bone to, sh to shrink by uh, 5% because of these endocrine disruptors. This is the mortality of otters from work we've done over the years. Um, um, Roads is the biggest cause of, of mortality. Otters go in, in the, the creel pots we use, we use them for lobsters. We put them in the same sort of depth as the otters uh, that swim, because otters don't only uh, uh, dive to about four to five meters, because the water compresses the air and the insulation goes. Um, it, it, it sort of predators we have white tailed seals will take otter cubs and gray atlantic seals will take otter cubs and also man who snares them and shoots them this is not an on a seal i mean the seal can hold a breath for 20 minutes otters can only hold a breath for three to four Minutes so they go into a, a lobster pot and it can't get out and they all die. And it's often the, the juveniles who will do this. Road mortality, as I mentioned on the other slide, is the biggest cause of death. We were losing about, I don't know, 20 otters on the other the sky. And we found otter hotspots. This is a culvert underneath the road. There's a big road under there. And rather than go under the culvert, the otters don't like to, they go up on the side and onto the road to get back to the rotter halt. So we decided to try and do something and we used wildlife warning reflectors that are made by a Swarovski, the little plastic prisms and that they actually deflect the light out. We used in Germany for a deer and Australia for kangaroos. We were the first people to use them on otters. Uh, we used, used the white ones. And how they work is, well, they're, they're the set up over that the, sort of culvert I was showing you before. And when a culvert goes past in the dusk or the evening, they, they deflect the light out into the countryside, which um, startles the otter and the car goes past and then it can cross. Obviously, it can only be used on roads that don't have an incredible amount of uh, traffic. And we used, put them on all the hot spots in the island that we live, right? and we classed a hot spot of more than three deaths in five years. Uh, after we put them there, we actually brought down the mortality. This is old, old data now, but we brought down the mortality from 16. To quite low numbers. If you want to look at otters in the wild, you have to become an otter a detective. So you have to use secondary signs, and it's learning the secondary signs gives you a chance of watching otters in the wild. Uh, uh, this is not a footprint. If you get good uh, otter footprints, they have uh, five toes, and like the dog, which has four, because they Obviously, the fifth toe is up. Is is the dewclaw? It's the same. Same with the uh, fox. This is a good uh, print. You can see in the mud. You can see the webbing because our otters have a five-toed web uh, foot. You can you can see an otter run uh, with this weasley like. Fellows run and they'll the sprain on the otter run. The, the sprain is the um, uh, deposit when they go to the toilet, and this is a sprain uh, uh, close up. It consists of mucus and fish bones, or 
little uh, mammal bones, but otters also have an anal scent gland. And somebody at Aberdeen University did research into the scent. And there's about 300 different chemicals. And um, by an otter smelling it, it can identify if it's male or female or young or old, or one or two of the chemicals, the otter can identify an individual by smelling the otter dropping. And if you think that's his fault, uh, a fetch, we used to do trips out to Russia, uh, watching brown bears, and they use trained KGB sniffer dogs to identify individual brown bears by smelling the yeah. dropping. This is an otter's holt or the home on coasts. They use rocky outcrops. Um, they'll use on the trees. Um, in areas like Shetland, they'll dig the holt in, into the peat. And you can see otters are hard to see. On coastal areas, they blend in with the seaweed or the kelp, and then they'll appear. They have ears, nose, and eyes really close to the water, so they can dip down and dive and go such a long way and then come up again, and you could be homing your binoculars where you last saw them dive in there a long, long way away. And this is an otter sprinting, and you can see the outer otter hair. You can see the ears, eyes and nose in this straight line. And you can see the tail that they also use as a rudder in the swimming. We've done otter rehabilitation. We get about 12 young otters a year, mostly because the mothers have um, been killed on the road. So people say you shouldn't interfere, but if humans, of course, at the loss of the mother, then I think we have, have a right to interfere. And as I said sort of before, otters stay with the mother 13 to 14 months, so it's a long, long uh, process, and it's quite expensive as well. Um, these are the young otters. Um, it's best to bring up otters in uh, twos, because then they get used to being otters. The biggest thing we don't want to do is it, is imprint them so we don't talk to them or anything because we want our otters to go back into the wild and have the best chance of the survival. This is another one. This is a young Eurasian otter. It looks quite nice, um, but the, uh, the, the, the teeth even at this age can cause you incredible damage, as I know, because I was in the hospital for a week. It's not a slime. Okay. These are cubs by the month. There's no definite pattern. These, these are the cubs we've had over the years. We've now, this was again an old slide, we've now had over 230 otter cubs we've looked after. And again, it's a long, long uh, process. So how do we bring them up? We always use, use the vet because we are uh, uh, vets and we're Really fortunate our vet lives the two doors away. Then we have an indoor otter hospital where we can keep the animals nice, nice and warm. And then we have outdoor pens, and and then we have the croft. A croft is a small home in a small uh, farm in Scotland. It's, it's a word used in the Highlands of Scotland. Okay, so we always get the vet to inspect them. Their feeds on, um, on a milk substitute we have to get from, from America. There's a company called Zoo Logic to produce any milk. You can get walrus or grizzly bear or obviously we get otters. People often bring up otters, get an otter cup and think they're doing it well. Bring it on cow's milk, otters die on uh, a lactose. Cow's milk is about 30% lactose, I think, and otter's milk is about 0.5. And then they'll start taking the solid fish. And then 
we put them in the outside pens and we can keep keep the otter boxes with with a heat pad and keep them warm and these are our uh, sort of trough pens these are a 25 meter pen so we only sort of uh, feed them once a day so they stay wild which is a problem when you start to catch them because a male adult also is incredibly aggressive and then if we sort of release them we we used to build a soft sort of release where we've we were finding the animal could hear and smell the surroundings but over the years we found that they got really annoyed in this pen for a day or two. So now we just do a simple just release. And this is the otter going back into the wild. And people say, is it upsetting? And when you see the animal you've cared for going back into the wild, and it isn't at all, it's the best thing. That's why we do it. They have to live in the wild. That's where they belong. And because of all this effort, in the initial period, we radio tracked them and we found they were eating fish within uh, half an hour. And the radio track fell off after three weeks, but they were still okay in the wild. We've done also survey work. Um, I did my PhD on the effect of geology on the distribution of otters around the outer sky. This is, the, this is where uh, we live, but over the years, we've used volunteers and done more. The survey work. I was a, a geologist in the beginning before I did a PhD in otter ecology. Um, so these are the surveys we've done over the years. Um, obviously, the original one was the Isle of the, the Sky. Um, we've used a lot of uh, volunteers who actually paid for the. Uh, passage this is some of the, of the boats because where we live the coastline is quite um, a remote um, so what did we serve we served we we actually divided the coastline into 500 meter data sets and we surveyed how many hulks were in the 500 meters did we see us for how long we surveyed the, uh, the freshwater pools and the, and the sprinting points. Um, we, sorry, we, we surveyed the, the slope of the shoreline, the inland vegetation, and the, was the substrate of the coast boulder or sand or shingle. And this is what we got. And we looked at the uh, geology, and you can see here the, the Torreonian coastline is the highest density of otters. Uh, high density of sprains, high density of everything. This was a prime otter habitat. And when we looked at other areas of Torridon and after this was the prime otter habitat because the, the gently sloping shoreline and it had the highest density of the freshwater pools. And we, you could estimate otter numbers because there's a correlation between active otter holts and resident uh, females. Hans Crook did the original work on Shetland and I did it on the other the sky. So by counting after otter holes, there's, a, there's an equation you can use. And you can see here, you can, I stripped it back to the, the geology of the coastline. You can see here the Tordoni sandstone at the highest density of otters for the kilometers. And areas like the, the granite and the gabbros and the tertiary basalt levels had the lowest, and we extrapolated that out, <coughs> excuse me, and we came up with otter populations um, of the islands that we uh, uh, surveyed. It's not, it's scientific, um, but it's probably not as good as doing a, a, a DNA work, which, which is incredibly expensive. We've used the camera traps over the years, um, to monitor otters. Uh, we put them out areas of uh, uh, freshwater pools along the coast. <coughs> Excuse me. These are the, some of the, of the pictures over the years. But we were, we we're also getting a, a data on otters that live in coastal environments. This is one of them. Should he actually push that over? 
eventually, obviously, we had to have another camera. And we found that our otters that they thought to be a, a, a diurnal living in the coastal areas or active during the day were really active most of the day. They went through bouts of uh, feeding, then they went through bouts of sleeping, then they went through bouts of uh, uh, feeding again. We also looked at in 86 and Shell and Hans Crook, because the people were start, in our country were starting to, and, and actually other countries were starting to use otter spraying, so the dropping as a correlation between otter populations. And the Environment Agency in Britain did it in the last, latest survey. And Hans Crook did the original work and said there was not a really a, a, a correlation between Otter numbers are not the droppings. And we wanted to do some more work on this. I mentioned the Environment Agency 2012, that there's a river in Northern England and it's had a 44% increase. They said they had a 44% increase in otter numbers, but it was a 44 increase in the sprinting numbers or otter droppings. So we wanted to do some work on this as well. So we took two really good otter areas on the coast, our niche. And Loch and Dal, and over a year, we used camera traps and weekly sightings and locals what they offer, so we could get a reason, reasonable accuracy of what populations occupying this this coastal area. And on a monthly basis, we counted the sprints, and you can see the sprint numbers. There's no correlation between otter numbers and sprint numbers. And sprinting points, that's, that's actually the point, a point where Otter would deposit and sprint, but there was, sorry, at Loch Nadal there was no correlation in sprinting points. There was no, no a correlation again. So you can't really use Otter sprint numbers to say you have an increase in Otters. Since um, 1993, when the International Survival Fund started, um, we've been working abroad. We've now got over 30,000 uh, uh, supporters, and we've done work in many areas. Um, this is the auto conservation status, and you can see otters are declining. Most of the otters are declining. Um, the giant otter is slightly stable in the North American river otter, although this is based on really dubious scientific uh, data, I would say. Um, these are the countries we've been working in. Um, I can't see the slide, probably. Um, the, the blue area is the work we've done since 93, and the brownie colors is as countries we worked on in 2019. We, we funded work on the diet of the Cape Clawless Otter in South Africa because nobody had done any work on it. Um, we looked at the, the sea cat, Lantrophilina is the smallest otter in the world. It occurs in little islands off the Chilean coast. It's drastically a decline and nobody knew anything about it. Um, we campaigned to stop the fur trade in America. America is so annoying because they kill the fur about 50,000 North American uh, river otters a year. Even Western Europe imports the furs. And uh, at conferences I've been to, they've gone on about, I mean, the fur trade in Asia is appalling, and this, that, which it is, but people in Asia are poor. You know, that I was in of Vietnam and a guy said to me, if he gets a hairy nose otter, if he kills hairy nose otter, he can sell the skin for as much money he makes in a, his, uh, a fish ponds in a year. Um, we worked in Belarus uh, for Dean Isidorovich and he came up with quite rightly that if you want to bring otters back into an area that doesn't have some and the habitat's right, bring back beavers first because if you bring out beavers, they build, uh, they put the dam up and 
and then you get a fish pond and you get drastically increasing prey species and otters appear. And that's what happened in Argyll in Scotland where we introduced the beaver and otters are improving there. Um, I went to an otter conference in Czech Republic in 2019 and the people from Asia, the otter experts said the hairy nose otter was extinct. It's obviously called the hairy nose otter because it had hairs on, on, on the nose. And we got some money from the Rainforest Foundation and did some work in Cambodia and then uh, Vietnam and they found a small population of the hairy nose otter. And now the hairy nose otter has been found in um, um, obviously Cambodia, Vietnam, and uh, Tibet, and uh, Malaysia. And this is us searching for the hairy nose otter. We are finding the prints, and we put some camera traps, and we got some of the first ever pictures for a long time of the hairy nose otter, Lutra Sintrana. We worked over the years, um, we've actually funded work on all 13 species of otters, so in 2014 we actually produced a, a book, Otters of the World, which was uh, revised in 2017, and you can get it from the otter shop on our website. We helped work in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, they used to kill the mothers, and this was a baby, uh, Congo clawless otter, which is really rare, and we managed to fund this being brought up. And it became an ambassador, and the chief, chief sorry, of the tribe said, we aren't going to hunt otters anymore. And eventually it disappeared in Upper River into the wild. There's an alarm in trade and also affairs we're constantly campaigning about. Um, they, if you think the global illicit wildlife trade is worth more than $23 billion a year, it's the fourth largest black market after drugs and human trafficking and arms and smuggling. So we, um, Obviously, everybody loves tigers and hippos and rhinos and elephants, but otters are forgotten, really. Um, our friend Dr. Hussain in India said for every one tiger skin, there were 10 otter skins, and six was these of the rare hairy nose otters. This is a market in a Tibet, and look at the height of the people. There are 778 otter skins ready for the market. Because also skin is incredibly good as a thermal insulator. And we've actually over the years been campaigning with really nice people. This was this was a hairy nose otter in Cambodia and it was living in quite bad it was it was a captive um, hairy nose otter and we managed to get some funding and build it a new otter pen. And the Buddhist monks of uh, Cambodia that sort of blessed it, and it was it was the only captive hairy nose otter in the world, where at least it lived in a reasonable environment. We've had workshops in in Indonesia, and since they've given better protection for the smooth coated and the Asian short clawed otter. Um, this is us working in the field. We've brought our identification charts with the help of the Rough Foot Foundation for ranges in a lot of, lots of the Asian uh, countries. I can't read that, but uh, it explains the differences in the species that, that look like otters. We had our first conference in Bangladesh in 2014, and even now we have people working on otters in Bangladesh. Um, This is a education with young schools in Bangladesh. We set up uh, a team otter. It's, it's an education thing for young people, and we have we have team otters in Ghana, Bangladesh. Uh, maybe we can have it in uh, Tunisia. We've got it in um, 
Montenegro, obviously Scotland and England. And they can keep in, the, the children can keep in uh, a touch with one another all around the world. We had a first ever workshop in Africa in 2015, and we had it in the Rangers training workshop at, at sort of a complex where they train Rangers who go into the field and show, show the toys lines and love them. Um, hyenas and elephants and all the other species of birds that are there. And the director of the, uh, the ranger conference said to me, why are you here? We don't have any otters. And I said, well, yes, you do. You've got four species of otter in Tanzania. So it's quite a shame that otters are forgotten and even people like that. I didn't know, but, but since we went, they've introduced otters into the mangrove ecology training. Um, so that's, that's the beginning. And we were, we were finding otter sprains here. This was actually found by the rangers because the rangers told me they see otters regularly. Um, this was the African otter. This is, this is a group of people at, at the college in at Tanzania. We got invited to go to Japan. The, the, uh, the Japan have a, had a subspecies of Lutra Lutra, it's Lutra Lutra, the Nippon, and it became extinct. And they invited us over to think about ways they could reintroduce the original sub onto back. This is the decline. And it was, I think it was officially thought to be extinct in, in in the 2000s. This is the last picture of Lutra Lutra at Nippon. Um, we had a workshop in Laos in 2018. And this was really interesting because we found the first evidence of the Eurasian in Laos ever. It's just by going out and looking really. And this, is, this is the workshop. Uh, this is where we found the sprains of the Eurasian because it has a Definite the smell compared to other species. Then we went to uh, 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 Guyana last November um, with an American organization called Saves the Giants, and we had a workshop and saw the giant otter, uh, which is a magnificent. Thing, um, but the most amazing thing, uh, a jaguar, and that's what we saw, which was amazing. This is the group who went to uh, Guyana. We still have people working out in uh, uh, Guyana. Uh, so thank you for listening. And if anybody has any uh, questions, I'll be really happy to answer. So, uh, Dr. Paul, thank you for this presentation and uh, for the valuable information. I'm sure that uh, uh, most of us learned something new today. Mm -hmm. So, I think that so far we have a question from uh, Burhan. Mm -hmm. said, based on your uh, your intervention, you said that uh, uh, some species of otter have not don't have really uh, a temper niche. But we can find them. Uh, any time uh, during the day. Yes. Uh, the question is uh, whether if in Tunisia and North Africa is it the same, whether the climate can really affect uh, uh, like the time and uh, maybe the temporal niche of this, uh, this species, the origin, uh, the origin uh, species? I think the climate probably would have an effect on the Eurasian otter in your uh, country because they probably wouldn't like the extreme uh, Warmth, I don't think. All right, so uh, um, also we have another question, maybe a little bit technical, but mm -hmm. uh, some uh, fellows uh, is asking uh, if you can uh, give us an idea about uh, uh, the protocol, how to estimate the other population. How would you in in increase an other population? how to uh, estimate the other population ah yeah if you can if you can uh, 
find Otter Holt's, you know, the home. There's a relationship between Otter Holt numbers and active uh, females. Mm -hmm. But the best way to do it would be using a DNA, and you can get a DNA from the otter dropping. Mm -hmm. And there's there's people who do that, and I could I could put you in uh, contact with people. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, also we have a question uh, we from Chi Young uh, who uh, says that there is a, a huge gap of home range, uh, home range between male and female in coastal area. Uh, he wants to know why and uh, do you conduct the research in finding uh, out coastal others home range? Because it's it's the female that has has the territory mostly. And if, if the habitat's right, it can be three, four uh, kilometers on the coast, maybe 30 kilometers in the river. But the males will uh, um, wander between different females, so they have a much bigger home range. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that make? All right. Yeah. Uh, also, we have another question uh, uh, from Sayanti Bajak. I hope that I'm pronouncing the noun correctly. So uh, he said that what is the height at which wider horn reflectors can be placed for others? Uh, sorry, could could you repeat it? So he is asking what is the height the height at which wider warning reflectors can be placed for others? Oh, you yeah. We placed we placed a meter high. Sorry, we didn't about a meter high. About the meter, but yeah, meter. And it is the same for all uh, species of otter, or it can. Be yeah, they've they've used them in uh, um, China as well. Um, it's worked. Right. Great. Yeah. So uh, um, another question from uh, Fouz. Uh, does the wide of a river affect the existence of the otter, like the large? Basically, it's the width of an otter effect. Yeah, width width yeah. of the river. Yeah. Um, I don't think so because they're good. Uh, uh, good. But I don't think there's any scientific evidence or scientific uh, data. But I don't think it would. Yeah, fair enough. Mm -hmm. So um, they are asking about how do you do you manage to involve the uh, the locals the local community in otters conservation programs? It's always important when we've, we've had the workshops, we, we don't ever go in as people, uh, Westerners thinking we know everything. So we've always involved the locals by bringing them to the workshops, they're doing things with, with the children. We always involve the children and then that gets the parents involved and interested. And it's a really good way to do it. All right. Uh, another question uh, from Sayanti. Um, he is asking, I have one more question. So how long does it uh, take for an author to be accepted by a group or for, 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 from a new group uh, first release? I think it's a different thing with the um, Eurasian also because they live a solitary life, so they, they don't live in groups. Mm -hmm. With things like Asian shore clawed otters or smooth coated otters, it's difficult for an individual to get into the into the group. It's really hard. But our otter and the same otter you have in your uh, country mostly live a solitary lifestyle. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Um Another question from uh, Chi Yong. Uh, he, uh, he said that he saw a slide showing you are conducting graduate tracking as well. Uh, so are you using uh, a harness as the attachment? No, no, we haven't. We have we haven't used the harness. We we glued a transmitter right at the back of the neck mm -hmm. at the inner fur, so it, it couldn't get the paws up. So, and we, we've never used an implant. People use, they put a battery pack in the gut, but our, our organization will whatever do that. 
All right. So um, I think these are all uh, all the question. If uh, mm -hmm. there is someone who did have another question, uh, you are welcome to ask. As we're gonna move on. Um, so I, I think that's it. So um, I could listen to I, the question. There is one, another I, another question. Uh, no, I could listen to the. Oh, sorry, sorry. All right. So uh, there is uh, Mohammed who is asking why our river otters are less visible than sea otters. It's because they have a bigger um, uh, home range. They have about thirty uh, kilometers. Mm -hmm. If the habitat's right on the coast, they have about three to five. On all otters on the coast are active during the day. On otters in a river are active during the night. So it's far more difficult to see them. All right. Um, so that's it, I guess, for questions. So um, I want to thank you oh, no, uh, for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to thank uh, all the participants. And um, I want to uh, remind you that tomorrow we're going to get a, lot, a little bit specific and talk about uh, maybe our uh, Tunisian population and North African population. You can join us, Dr. Yeah. Parla. I would like to, yeah, I would like to. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, I think that uh, that's it for today. Uh, okay, can I, I guess, say thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody.